Ohe Vaishnava Takura Toya Rasagara Eta Sekharu Kore Vaishnava Takura Toya Rasagara Eta Sekharu Kore Dipo Padachaya Soto e a Maia, tomara charana dore. Dio pata chaia, soto e a Maia, tomara charana dore. Vaishnava takura, doya rasakara, eta se karura kore. Vaishnava Thakura Doya Rasa Gara Eta Sekharu Nankori Chaya Bekha Domi Chaya Dosha Shoti Chaya Guna Deho Dase Chaya Bekha Domi Chaya Dosha Shoti Chaya guna de hunga se Chaya satsanga Teo he amare Boshe chi shangera ashe Vaishnava takura Doya rasa gara Eta se karura kori Vaishnava Kakura Doya Rasa Gada Eta Sekharu Rakori Eka Ki Amara Nahi Bhaya Bala Harinama Sankirtane Eka Ki Amara Nahi Bhaya Pala Hari Nama Sankirtane Tumi Kripa Kori Shraka Bindu Diya Deho Krishna Nama Dane Tumi Kripa Kori Shraka Bindu Diya Deho Krishna Nama Dane Oh, hey, Vaishnava Takura, Doya Rasa Gara, Eta Sekaruna Kori. Vaishnava Takura, Doya Rasa Gara, Eta Sekaruna Kori. Krishna Sitomara, Krishna Dito Payo Tomara Shakati Ache Krishna Sitomara Krishna Dito Payo Tomara Shakati Ache Abito Kangala Krishna Krishna Boli Dai Tava Pache Pache Amitot Kangala Krishna Krishna Boli Dai Tava Pache Pache Vaishnava Takura Doyara Sakara Eta Sekaruna Kori Ohe Vaishnava Takura Doya Rasa Gara Eta Sekaruna Kori Chaya Vaishnava Takura Chaya Vaishnava Takura Vaishnava Takura Chaya Vaishnava Takura 
Jai Vaishnava Thakur Jai Vaishnava Thakur Jai Vaishnava Thakur Jai Vaishnava Thakur Prabhupada 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 Jai Prabhupada 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 Jaya Prabhupada Jai Guru Dev Guru Dev Guru Dev Jai Guru Dev Guru Dev Guru Dev Guru Dev Jai Guru Dev Ananda Kuti Vaishnava Vrinda Ki Jai Namachara Srila Haridas Thakur Ki Jai Premisi Koshi Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Kadhadhara Sri Vasudhi Gaura Bhakta Rinda Ki Jai Sri Sri Rata Krishna Gopu Gopina Chama Kunda Radha Kunda Sri Giri Gopadam Ki Jai Sri Vrindavan Dham Ki Jai Sri Navadvip Maya Pudam Ki Jai Ganga Maya Muna Mai Ki Jai Tulasi Devi Tulasi Maharani Ki Jai Sama Veda Bhakta Rinda Ki Jai Gaura Premanandi Hare Krishna Hare Krishna, welcome everyone. Welcome Anil, welcome Arju, Brakash, welcome Rashika. Welcome back from the dead. And welcome Varshana Kishori Mataji. Rashika went through COVID and Anil and the whole family went through COVID. But Krishna saved everyone and we are all still here. Thank you very much. A beautiful Lord has done his uh, bit uh, in the fire department uh, when there is trouble. Krishna, Krishna, help us. And he came and has helped us. And uh, it is not for granted that uh, anyone who is down with Corona comes out at the other end more or less intact and not... Uh, uh, the worst has not happened. Okay, welcome. And at that time, Anil, he said, I'll promise, <laughs> it's a beautiful promise, I'll promise I will come every Wednesday and every Saturday meeting. Uh, so tonight, Anil, you kept your promise and I'm very proud of you because the mind is always coming. So many excuses. Some seem to be quite rational and some are less rational, but some, that's the business of the mind to drag us to something else than Krishna. But tonight it was uh, a, a, a conquest over the mind. And not only that, Anil brought his daughter Arzu Omanisha to the association, the Sangha of devotees. So that is absolutely very, very beautiful. And anybody else here tonight, if you know of anyone who you would think could benefit from the association of devotees, inspire them, bring them along. For their eternal benefit and uh, your benefit as well, because uh, Lord Chaitanya will very much appreciate your outreach of not only helping yourself to become Krishna conscious, but helping others as well. Okay, can you hear me well? Anyone can say? Vaishana Mataji, what do you say? Can you hear me? Yes, it's perfect. So, perfect, the audio. So, Vaishnava Madhachi, would you like to read us uh, the translation of this beautiful song, O Vaishnava Thakura? Um, yes, Prabhu Hare Krishna, everyone. O venerable Vaishnava, O ocean of mercy, be merciful unto your servant. Give me the shade of your lotus feet and purify me. I hold on to your lotus feet. Teach me to control my six passions, 
rectify my six faults, bestow upon me the six qualities and offer unto me the six kinds of holy association. I do not find the strength to carry on alone, the Sankirtana of the holy name of Hari. Please bless me by giving me just one drop of faith with which to obtain the great treasure of the holy name of Krishna. <clears throat> Krishna is yours. You have the power to give him to me. I am simply running behind you, shouting, Krishna, Krishna. So my question was, Bhaktivinoda Thakur is addressing, oh Vaishnava Thakur, oh venerable Vaishnava, who is he speaking to? Anil, what do you say? Who is Bhaktivinoda Thakur speaking to? Uh, not sure, Prabhu. Not sure. Anybody is sure? Rashika. Who is he speaking to? We have read this beautiful translation. Who is Bhaktivinoda Thakur speaking to? Who is that, O oh, venerable Vaishnava Thakur? You have Krishna. Give me Krishna. Who? Who could it be? Vaishnava. Would that be his guru? That will be guru. In general, guru. He speaks for all of us. Sir. And who is his guru? Who is the guru of Bhakti no Thakur? Who is the spiritual master of Bhakti no Thakur? We have some pictures on the altar. We have Srila Prabhupada on the left. His spiritual master is Gokishodas Babaji. His spirit uh, uh, is uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. Goswami Maharaj, his spiritual master is Koki Shodas Babaji. His spiritual master is Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Who is the spiritual master of Bhakti Vinod Thakur? Some temples have that picture on the altar, on the right. Vashana. Oh, sorry, I can't remember, Prabhu. Anil, you are very learned. Not learned, Prabhu. Uh, don't. Don't well, if you're not learned, that's why you're here tonight. It is Chakana Das Babaji Maharaj said, you will remember that story, that wonderful, over a hundred, much more than a hundred years older, he couldn't walk anymore in his old age. He was carried in a basket. He was so old, he couldn't lift his eyelid, eyelids by his own strength. So people had to open his eyelids. People had to lift his eyelids. So that is absolutely most amazing. So he, Bhaktivinoda uh, Thakur, he had some vision of, uh, he, he researched the birthplace of Mahaprabhu. So he had some vision in the distance, a shining light when he was one day on the balcony. So he went to that place and there he found a hill completely covered by Tulsi plants. And he asked the villagers, what, what is this? Because Lord Chaitanya's place of birth was presumed to be on the other side on the Navadvip side of the Ganga, but in 500 years, the Ganga has shifted so many ways and nobody really, really knew. So he consulted all maps and so on. And uh, so the villagers said, that is a ghostly hunted place. Don't go there. There is some strange sounds coming at night and uh, Muslims around that area. So. He determined, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, on various signs and the old maps he consulted, this was actually the birthplace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And from his balcony, that was exactly what he has seen, the shining light. And uh, uh, so he went to his spiritual master. He wasn't his Diksha Guru, he was his Shiksha Guru. Our Sampradaya is a Shiksha Sampradaya. Not the Babaji line, where only by Diksha and the next one is Diksha and physical initiation. No, it was by following uh, the orders, uh, by picking up of the 
potent previous Acharya teachings. So he accepted Chakana Das Babaji as his guru, as his spiritual master. That was his uh, uh, main guru. Also, he had received Diksha from Vipin Bihari Goswami, but uh, he uh, more prominent was uh, Chakana Das Babaji Maharaj. So he took his spiritual master, Chakana Babaji Maharaj, so carried him in a basket to set place with a uh, covered in Tulsi plants. Uh, and uh, when uh, they came to that place, that, uh, I don't know, 150, 200 years, or I don't know how old, but very old, much more than 100. Uh, he jumped out of the basket uh, and started dancing. Go, hurry, hurry, bowl, hurry, bowl, hurry, bowl, hurry, bowl. And thus he confirmed, his spiritual master confirmed, this was actually the birthplace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So that's just a little bit of story. Who is Chakana Das Babaji Maharaj? So by this story, maybe you will remember, he is a spiritual master of Bhaktivinotaku. Hare Krishna. So now we have, uh, who remembers what we have done last time in regards to Bhagavad Gita? Who remembers which verse we have covered last time? Anyone remembers? Who was there last time? Uh, Vaishnava Mataji have been there. What did we cover last time? What was the topic? I can't remember exactly, but uh, I think we, we did this second chapter and um, I think- there Second were chapter, left. correct, yes. Uh, there were a few things left. Um, uh, that you were going to cover this time, because we yes, almost do you remember reached... the last verse we covered in the no. second chapter? No, <laughs> sorry. Does it ring a bell? Karpan yadosho pahata Does it ring a bell? Not really. <laughs> and what what does that verse mean? No, that I don't. is when. Uh, Arjuna accepted Krishna as his spiritual master. Right in the second chapter, early on. Uh, and once Arjuna has accepted uh, Krishna as his spiritual master, then the relationship changed, right? The relationship changed from friendly to guru and disciple, a different relationship altogether. So here we are with a screen share. Now I'm confused about my duty and have lost all composure because of weakness. In this condition, I'm asking you to tell me clearly what is best for me. Now I am your disciple and the soul surrendered unto me. Please instruct me. And then Krishna's instructions begin to Arjuna. Early on, the 11th shloka of the second chapter. Now, in the next verse, Krishna says, the blessed Lord said, we have actually also read this verse. While speaking learned words, you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. So who are wise lament neither for the living nor the dead. What, that is, what is that? What are you making out of that, Vaishnava? What is Krishna saying? He's accepted Arjuna, accepting Krishna as a spiritual master, and it sounds rather harsh. Well, what? he's basically telling him that um, not to lament for the living or the dead, that uh, we are all, the, the body is uh, just material. And uh, when somebody dies, we should not lament. It's less, just like taking off a garment off your body and putting on a new garment. So therefore, we should not grieve for the dead. Um, instead, um, rejoice in one sense as they have moved on to a new body, which is more, um, which would be again more spiritual and not just material anymore. Why would it be more spiritual? Well, I, well, they would. It would be a fresh start, wouldn't it? It would be a it new would body. Be a, a, a new body. Huh? 
<clears throat> the old body may be diseased or old aged and pains and uh, here and there and the new body is just uh, it's just like an old coat uh, we put it aside and it has holes here and there like my coat and the inside comes out and I put a little bit of cellar tape over it <laughs> that it doesn't come out and it will maybe it last another year it will certainly go through this winter so patching it up but then once we get a new coat then that is a completely different story and nothing to be patched up and in fact Krishna made the argument, what are you worrying, Arjuna? Huh? Uh, uh, if you kill Drona and Bhishma, you're so much worried. Huh? They're getting new bodies. They're getting new bodies. So what is there to worry about? Huh? What is there to worry about if we get a new coat, a new shirt? That is one argument. But what is the kind of mood? Anil, what, what are you saying? What is that mood of this? <laughs> the blessed Lord said, while speaking learned words, you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. What is that mood of, I mean, just before Arjuna accepted Krishna as his spiritual master. And so it doesn't sound like a very, uh, very um, kind words. Anil, what are you saying? What, what is that mood Krishna is speaking here? What does he do actually? Not only said one should not lament, but in what kind of mood? What would you say? I, I think his mood is, uh, he's suddenly taken the mood uh, of, of a teacher who's, um, who's telling off, sort of, uh, look, you, you talk of very learned words, you use very learned words, uh, but uh, you don't know the essence. Uh, I think I can recognize this mood in my, my teachers. <laughs> me. <laughs> yes, exactly. You, you are spot on. Thank you very much, Anil. Huh? He's chastising. He's chastising Arjuna. Srila Prabhupada elaborates in his purpose on that. Srila Prabhupada says, actually, he's calling Arjuna a fool. As soon as he's accepting spiritual, spiritual master is not, not there to always say, oh, yeah, right, well done, bravo, and... No, spiritual master is there to also chastise the disciple. And Shastra tells us there is no difference between the chastisement of the spiritual master or the praise of the spiritual master. Same with Krishna. There is no difference if Krishna is praising or is Krishna is chastising. Chastisement. Why is there no difference? Because we can learn, <clears throat> can learn something from that. So, the first thing after accepting uh, the spiritual master, Krishna is chastising him. You speaking learned words. You, you, you think you're such a learned philosopher. You're such a learned person. Because Arjuna, at one point, he also says, I heard from Shastra said one should never kill one's family members in the sinful act. And he brings that line of argument. But Krishna says, you speaking very learned words. But you are grieving her uh, about over the, the garment, uh, over the outer garment of, uh, of uh, your relatives and family members. Uh, you shouldn't grieve. A wise man, a really wise man, he not lamenting, neither was the living nor the death, he, because he knows exactly what are, what, what, is, uh, what is what, basically. And after all, everyone who was killed on the battlefield of Kshetra, they got liberation because Krishna was present. So let's, let's take one further. Uh, uh, important verse. Natve vaham chetuna sam natvam nemi chanati paha natchevana bhavishya maha sarvevayam ataparam. Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you know all these kings. Nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. We have done this verse. Anil, what are you making of this verse? What is Krishna saying? That's a very, very important verse. We're not going through all the verses of the second chapter. It would take way too much. We're going through key verses, important markers in the second chapter. So, Anil, what, what are you making of that? Never was there a time when I did. 
What is Krishna basically saying? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think uh, this verse for me is one of the most the most important uh, verses. This is telling us uh, how to differentiate between spirit and matter. Uh, basically, he's, he's, he's saying is you. Uh, it's telling you who you are. Basically, he's saying that we are all spirit souls. We are all transcendental to material nature. Atah uh, param param means transcendental, and sarve means all of us. Uh, Ataha means likewise, Param means transcendental. So we all transcend the uh, material existence. and We are not material bodies, we are spirit souls. Uh, and uh, he's telling of uh, the eternal nature of uh, spirit, uh, nor having once been, does it ever cease to be uh, that time that there was never a time you were born and there will never be a time when you will die. Die because spirit uh, nature of spirit is that it does not undergo any change at all. It's it's and uh, and matter on the other hand is constantly changing. Yes, that is, is certainly true. That is certainly true. But there is more to it. This verse actually that the only verse in entire Bhagavad Gita which proclaims the individuality of the soul. Yes. Never was that time when I did not exist. I, Krishna, person mm -hmm. Krishna, nor you, individual, Arjuna, nor all these kings on the battlefield, individual souls. Huh? Neither in the past, I mean, they existed in the past, they existing now as individuals, and they existing in the future also. So this verse affirms the individuality of the soul. Why? Because there are people who think after liberation, I'll merge into the Brahman. I lose my individuality, which yes. is refuted by Krishna in this verse. Correct. Okay. Dehinusmin yata dehe kaumaram yavanam chara tata dehandara brabti diras tatranam muyati another marker, a milestone. Uh, Rashika, can you read the translation of that? I'm calling on you. I don't want anybody to fall asleep. Hello? Hare yes, Krishna. we can hear you. Hare Krishna, Rashika. By the way, Rashika, her father is a Rishi, Rishika. I actually should call you Rishika. But that is a proper meaning. So can you read us the translation? As the embo embodied soul continually passes in, in this body from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. The self-realized soul is not bewildered by such a change. What does it mean? Like how our body changes... And in the end, it's our, our soul is going to pass it to. <laughs> I'm just reading the same thing. Yes, uh, can we can, pass it can, to another body? Yes, can we see the change of body? Can you see change of body in your yes. life? Yes, you're the little girl, the older girl, the teenage girl, you. That is a change of body. What if someone would say to you, a question for anybody, uh, well, that's not a change of body, it's just growing. What would you say? Mm -hmm. What the counter argument? It's just growing. We're not changing bodies, we're just growing. Mm -hmm. That is true as well. <laughs> Anil, you are a very learned philosopher. What argument would you say to a person who says, no, we're not changing bodies, we are growing? Uh, Prabhu, the cells in the body, as we learn from medical science, are constantly dying and the new ones are being generated constantly. This is this is ongoing process. And in 100 years uh, of age, uh, you might have changed uh, your whole body a few times. Uh, so the so change is constant within this, you know, of, of body. That's a powerful argument. It's not a hundred years. 
Science have found out every seven years there is not a single cell in your body which was previously. Yeah, yeah, a few times in hundred years. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yes, that is a very powerful argument from uh, with scientific background. Uh, another argument could be given if I say here is a film in the cinema, old type of film, it's a film role, but it applies very well with digital films. They also have frames. I know that because I'm working a bit with video. There is single frames, 60 frames per second, 30 cents frames per second. But it's more easily explained with the old type of film roles in the, the celluloid roles in, in the movie theater. So each picture is a separate frame, a separate body, so to speak. And then we place them in quick succession and say, oh, he is walking. He is growing. He's not growing. Oh, that's an illusion because uh, you're playing all the separate frames in a quick succession and it looks like he is growing. But that's another way of explaining that. Okay. Next. Matras parshas tu kantiya shitoshna sukatukata agama paino nityas tamstitik shasvabharata. Now I would like to ask Arsu, you want to read that one? Just to get everyone a chance. Arsu, are you in India? Nine one is India, isn't it? Or not? Okay, if not, then. Sorry, um, it wasn't working on my phone, so I've just come here. <laughs> it wasn't could... working. How would you like to be addressed as Manisha or Arsu? Um, any will do. Um, Manisha is probably better. <laughs> okay, so is nine one is a Indian number? Uh, yes, I'm usually there. But I'm here in Leicester for a while. Okay, you you are here right now. Yes, yeah. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful! So you have the company of your dad, and he has your company. Happy family together. That is absolutely fantastic. Yes. You all. You also went through the COVID experience. Uh, yes, I did. Yeah, all better okay. now. Thank you. But you have come out whole and complete afterwards. Yes. Yeah, good, thanks. good. Very good. So I would love to ask you, can you read us this next translation? Sure. O son of Kunti, the non-permanent appearance of the happiness and distress and their disappearance in due course are like the appearance and disappearance of winter and summer seasons. They are arise from sense perception O Skion of Parada, and one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. What do you understand from that? <laughs> Sorry, one second, I'm just going to. Uh... Okay. That my two year old in the background. Yeah. What do we understand from that? Um, that happiness and distress aren't something that are like permanent or important in a way we could say. I mean, important, but not there permanently. Yes. And what example? we have here what example really uh, makes it very clear oh, from the weather the winter and summer seasons they change uh, yes come and go yeah yes it's just like uh, like winter and summer isn't it summer winter and summer come and go 
And so happiness and distress come and go. Do we have that uh, experience, happiness come and go, or is just only happiness and never distress, or only distress and never any happiness? Yeah, no, it's always both. It's always changing, isn't it? So yeah. we could think if we are in a distress, if we have COVID, we have caught the virus, uh, then there will come a better time afterwards. Uh. At yes. one point, it will be finished, one way or the other. And so, yes, that's a nice example. And one has to tolerate. One must learn to tolerate without being disturbed. Because generally, people are very much disturbed when there is distress coming and disturbed. How can that happen? Generally, people don't accept that the whole material world and not only world, the whole material universe is set up in a way there is happiness and there is distress. Both is there in equal measures. Now, Asu starts drawing on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> ben, Sorry. ben did that last time and he didn't know how to erase it, but there's <laughs> also an eraser. You can erase it as well. Yeah. Sorry. Don't know what we're doing here. <laughs> Krishna. So, and one more thing, it comes from sense perception, how, how we look at it uh, as a distress and happiness. There is a very nice saying that uh, pain is unavoidable in this body. Due to the body, in the spiritual world, there is no pain. In our spiritual body, there is no pain. But as we have this material body, so there is pain. So pain is unavoidable. There must be some pain. But suffering is optional. Right? Because suffering means we are in ignorance. We don't understand anything beyond the immediate pain or whatever we go through, the, the unhappiness or the distress. We don't understand. People blame others. Blame the weather, blame the government, blame this, blame that, uh, do for, for their distress. So I don't understand most people said happiness as well as distress are built in into this material world uh, due to our material bodies. So one more question. Where does happiness and distress come from? It must have some origin. Vaishana Mataji. Where do they originate? Happiness and distress, both. Um, that's, uh, I sort of know it because I just read a little bit. It's basically our karma as well. That's the we... right answer. And They're then... coming from our karma. Both. Now, can we, Anil, oh no, let's ask, yes, let's ask Anil, can we counteract our bad karma with good karma? No, I think it doesn't cancel each other like that. Uh, the the the, to get rid of uh, karma, you have it has to fructify. Uh, it doesn't go away without being without fructifying, and uh, only Krishna can, if he will, and forgive me. He says, "Aham uh, to So if he wills, he can forget, forgive. Uh, but uh, we cannot get rid of karma just by doing a good deed. The bad one will fructify no matter what. That's what my understanding is. Hare Krishna, that is a correct understanding. And you're very, you see, Anil is a very learned devotee. He can even quote Sarvadam uh, Paritya Mamikam Sharanam Racha. So that is one, the most important verse in the whole entire Bhagavad Gita. So, no, it doesn't cancel itself out. We have spoken about that many times. We cannot counteract bad karma with good deeds. We have to suffer and enjoy 
both. We have to suffer in the hellish planets, the bad karma, and we can then go to the heavenly planets, enjoy our good karma, or first go to the heavenly planets, enjoy, and then go down. That we might get such choice. We might get such choice. Which one first? But both has to be fulfilled. So, and yes, the only one who can wipe that karmic slate is Krishna. And for that, we have to surrender to Krishna. So how do we surrender to Krishna? Rashika. What's the way to surrender to Krishna? How can we do that? With the conscious mind. Whenever, mind very important, yes. Whenever we're ready with the conscious mind. Hmm. Yeah, more than that. Why should I she? Devotional service. Yes. And, That's, and surrender to Krishna. What, what is the best way of surrendering to Krishna? What is the main ingredients? Let's put it like that. Because Krishna is not so tangible. Huh? Bhakti? We cannot di directly surrender to Krishna, can we? So well, when we, we surrender, surrender, when we do devotional service, um, pure devotional service, and that's when you will get the benefits. And um, yes, the other yes. thing is uh, to acquire a guru. And ah, have that's a that's a that's a point. Krishna doesn't want us to directly contact him. Interesting. Krishna doesn't want that. He said, if you want to surrender to me, surrender to my devotee. Means pure devotee. Dasa and Dasa and Dasa and Dasa, a million times removed. Who are we? We directly, oh, I make directly contact with Krishna. I'm so advanced. I can make direct contact with Krishna. No. We go to Krishna's servant, to Krishna's pure devotee first. Like when we offer actually our food. Our food is not offered to the Lord immediately, straight. Actually, the food is offered to Guru, to Srila Prabhupada, and he offers it to Krishna because he's a right-hand man of Krishna. So that is the only way, the better and the only way of surrendering to Krishna, surrendering to Guru. Accepting a pure devotee as spiritual master. That's a must in all the Shastra. One must accept the spiritual master. Without a spirit, nobody can be without a spiritual master. One must accept a pure devotee as spiritual master. And as you said, Vaishnava Mata, she's serving. Said service is also done or given or it's done under the direction of the spiritual master. And he, all our service, not just we, we choose, uh, we invent our services. No, we have read from Srila Prabhupada in all the Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita how devotional service is to be executed, how deity worship is to be done. It's all in the Shastra. So where does it come from? From Srila Prabhupada, from the Vedas. So by under instruction, we serve. That is called Bhachana Kriya, engagement in devotional service. And then all our misgivings will be addressed and purified. Anartha nivriti. That is a clearing stage where all the dirty things in the heart but be, will be vanquished. But before that, it's faith. And that faith brings us into Sadhu Sangha, as we have tonight. One, two, three, four people have enough faith to come here tonight in the Association of Devotees and discuss Bhagavad Gita. Amit couldn't make it, he's working tonight. He always sends a text to let us know. And greetings to everybody else here. So, let's go further. Our next text, that was actually a revision. Now that next text is Nachayatim Riva Devakatajin 
famous text as well. Uh, Anil, can you read us that for the soul, that text? Uh, sorry, one second, Prabhu. Let me get my glasses. This is text 22. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, some see Jer I no, no, uh, no, not 21. 21, the top, top of page. 21, okay. Veda Vinashanim Nitum Eva Nitum Ya in Jan. This one. 20, 20, it is 20. 20. Do you have a Bhagavad Gita in front of you? Uh, yes, Prabhu, I've just opened it. Yes, we, we don't Na cover every single verse, just the key yeah. verses. Yeah, okay. Na jayate niyate va kadachi nayam bhuva bhavita vana bhuya ajo nityam shashvato yam purane na hanyate hanyamane sharire. Beautiful Sanskrit. Yes. <laughs> Translation. Okay. For the soul, there is neither birth nor death at any time. He has not come into being, does not come into being, and will not come into being. He is unborn, eternal, ever existing, and primeval. Uh, he is not slain when the body is slain. Can you have a look on your screen, Anil? Yes. Do you see the verse? 22. For the soul? Yes. Yes. Can you compare that on the screen with the version in your book? Uh, 22. I, I am looking at... For there is never a birth, never a soul. No, no, for the soul. That verse on top of the screen. On top of the which, oh, which oh, oh, oh. 20, 20. All right. Okay. Yes. Uh, one minute. I can make it bigger. 20. 20. Yeah. For the soul, there is neither birth nor death at any time. He has not come into being, does not come into being, and will not come into being. He is unborn, eternal, ever existing, and premium. I can make it big. Yeah, this is a one. It, uh, it's not, not a... And now look on the screen. Do you okay. see any dif difference? Uh, one second. I'm looking at. Uh, oh, for the soul, there is never birth nor death, nor having once been does it ever cease to be. He is unborn, eternal, ever existing, undying, and primeval. He is not slain when body is slain. And any difference to to your book and screen? I'm actually, I'm actually looking at uh, Veda base uh, Bhagavad Gita. On Veda base. So is, is there a difference? Well, I'm asking you that question. Look on your screen. In, in, in Zoom. In Zoom. He's not having to be. Yes, there is. This is. This is why is it different? That is my question for you. I don't know. I'm looking at Veda base and this is Bhagavad Gita as it is. I, this is amazing. Should you're looking be. at Veda base and you're looking at the Zoom screen and you find the two verses. Not that it is uh, drastically changing the meaning, but there is a difference. Why is this? Who can say? Uh, Why Shana Mataji? Is this because this is uh, written by Srila Prabhupada? It's the original version? Yes. That what we have on the Zoom screen is the original Macmillan a 75 version, Srila uh, Prabhupada's original version. And what you're reading on the Veda base as well as in a book. Are you reading from a book or from the Veda base, Anil? Mm. 
I, I am looking at Veda based on the screen, my big screen, but I've just opened uh, Bhagavad Gita as well, just to... Okay, what does it say in the Bhagavad Gita? I uh, will say... Read it. One second, uh, one second, Prabhu, I'll get to... Which the Bhagavad word. Gita is that? What Bhagavad picture Gita. is in front? As it is, Bhagavad Gita Swami Prabhupada. Yeah, yes, but yes, I mean, <laughs> that, that is for certain help. What what is a picture? Is it a small Bhagavad Gita as a book or a bigger one, a hardbound? It's a bigger one, Prabhu, the biggest one with all the pictures and everything. What's the picture on front cover? Uh, chariot. Uh, Mine. Oh, one minute. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> and uh, Arjuna on a chariot. That's a picture. 20. Yeah, for the soul, there's neither word nor that time. He's not going to be. Not going to be. Yes, I, in, in the book, and Veda base is the same. Uh, but uh, what the I'm. Book and the Veda base is the same, same, and the Zoom is different. Huh? Different, yes. So, Vaishnava Mataji already said what we're having here on Zoom are verses from the original Srila Prabhupada's uh, translation. And the Veda base, as well as uh, uh, the book you have, not all books are like that. I gave you some original books also. They're not like that. They're tying up with what is on the Zoom screen. Uh, okay. But the, the, the Bhagavad Gita, yes, of course, they're all by Swami Prabhupada, Bhagavad Gita as it is. But there have been made changes. 5,000 oh. changes in Bhagavad Gita have been made. And 5, uh, many, many devotees all over the world who are not very happy with that. We won't go into the detail, but there are differences. And in some places, there are big and not only grammatical differences, there are big differences. Anyway, here you see we have some difference. It doesn't change the meaning of the text, but nevertheless, are some differences. And if you find the Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna is speaking, Sri Bhagavan Vacha, and the translation is the Supreme Personality of God had said. Then you can be for sure that it's an edited version. The original, Srila Prabhupada's original version, the translation goes, the blessed Lord said. That is a tone Srila Prabhupada has lectured from for all of his time. And that is a Macmillan 75 Gita, the original one. Okay, that was just a side line. We're not getting too much hung up about that. Let's move on. Text 22. Vasamsi chirnani yatabiha yana bani grinadi naruparani tata shirirani vihani chirnani anyani samyati nabani dehi. That is very poetic, isn't it? Chirnani Grinati Sharirani Samyati Navani Chirnani Parani. My God, that's so beautifully composed. So let's read that translation from the screen if we can. So we're all reading on the, we're on the same page on the Zoom screen. And I would like to ask uh, Artsu back to Artsu and give us a reading. Offset what is on the Zoom screen. As a person puts on new garments, giving up old ones, similarly, the soul accepts new bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. Okay, that is quite clear, the meaning, isn't it? Quite straightforward yes, yes. and clear. There's not much to be said. It's the soul. Okay, one, one thing can be said. Sometimes people who are, most people in this world, uh, they don't understand the difference between body and soul. In fact, when they hear soul, they think, oh, that's religious, chumble mumble. Huh? There is no scientific basis for a soul. Huh? So basically they're saying, we are this body, we are a combination of chemicals. That's all. So, those who are a little bit coming out of that ignorance, they, they understand there is something more than this body. And they're saying, yes, I, I, I think there is a soul. I think we have a soul. Is there anything wrong with that statement? I think we have a soul. 
Anil, what do you say? If uh, someone yeah. tells you, I think we have a soul. Uh, statement is wrong. Uh, it says, we are a soul. I am a soul, not I have a soul. Correct. That's a nice understanding. We don't have a soul. Otherwise, we just, that is still materially contaminated. We're saying, I have a house. I have a car. I have a wife. I have three beautiful children. Huh? And I have also a soul. <laughs> It's a possession. It's another thing we have. My, me, mine. No, as you said, Anil, we are the soul. We have a body. I have a, a body born in Germany. I have a body born in India, in Kenya, in Africa, wherever. I have an, a, a brown body. I have a white body. I have a yellow body. I have a young body. I have an old. I have a female body. I have a male body. All of that, that we can say. But who is the I? The I is we, the soul. And the other person was saying, I have a soul, a wife, a house, a dog. Who is the I? The body. Big difference. You identify with the body and then I have also a soul besides a car and a house. And that is the wrong way around. We are the soul. As Anil, you said so nicely, and we identify with being the soul. So how can we determine? That's a good question. How can we determine there is something beyond? That's a scientific question. That's for you, Anil. You like this kind of. How can we determine there is something beyond this body and mind? Some people say think they are the mind. We are not the mind, we are neither. We are not the mind. So how, how can we, in a practical way, how can we determine, by, by scientific observation, how can we determine we are not this body and we are not this mind? Anil, what would you say? Um, first of all, uh, to understand it a bit logically, uh, something that is mine and me, myself, cannot be the same. So we say my body, uh, my body and I cannot be the same. So something we claim this is ours cannot be us. So that... that, that uh, That's a very powerful argument. That's a very powerful argument. Because if we don't accept that, I have a car, so I cannot be the car. Yes. It's a possession of yeah. mine. And the mine, me, is the body, if you accept that, or the soul, if you're a little bit more enlightened. Yes, carry on. Uh, yes. Uh, this, is, this is just one uh, to understand uh, logically. But then the second uh, uh, understanding is that we ourselves have seen uh, changes throughout our body, like uh, when we were young, we remember how we were at five, uh, then 10 and 20 and 30. We see the bodies have changed uh, all the time, but we, ourselves, we know we have never changed. Uh, we are our own witness, uh, basically. We are witness to our own change. And uh, bodies have changed, but the witness has not changed. So. So we, yes. we Thank you very much. That is a word. That's a magical word you just said. Witness. We are as an observer, right? We are observing that the body has changed. So how can we be the body? There are three things. There is a body. There's a mind or four things. There's intelligence, which is a little bit more to grasp because we cannot see it so much. But we can grasp the body easy. The mind, we all have a mind, we can grasp the mind, but there is a witness, there is an observer, right? We observing, most people have never ever observed their mind. It is not that difficult with a little bit of practice and a, a bit of knowledge. If we can, can observe our body of the baby body, small, childhood, boyhood, girlhood, teenager, young woman, and so on. We can observe the changes in our body. So we are the observer or witness. We are the observer. So that, that the observer is different from the body. We can also observe our mind. 
So if we can observe our mind, then we must be different from the mind. And that's the soul. That is consciousness. Oh, Anil could go on about consciousness for many hours. Sir. I know that. And we're going to do some, some recordings on that more, much more. Everybody liked Anil is that person who did with me the interview about deity worship. So some of you have seen that recording, hopefully all of you. Very, very enlightening uh, conversation about deity worship. And we'll do another one. Next one is already in the pipeline about worship in general. What is worship? What kind of worship? And so on. So we are the observer. We have to make the best time. Let's put it like that. The best time to observe the mind is the last thing at night. We are already ready for going to bed. We lay down in bed, but we haven't fallen asleep. Why is it the best time to observe the mind? Because in the day we are so busy and we are, the body is moving around and we don't very easily uh, can distinguish between body and mind. But the last thing before dozing off, <clears throat> when the body is laying in bed and uh, is not moving and is not acting, is not doing so many things and the hands are still and the legs are still and everything is just ready to go into sleeping mode, then we can actually look at the mind. And we look at the mind, what, what, what does it generate? The mind is constantly generating some thoughts, some pictures, some images, some sequences, and so on. The mind is generating all this uh, all the time. So if we step a step back uh, and just observe and just watch for a moment, uh, what's he coming up with now? Oh, right, that's, yeah, that's the same kind of pattern. He always comes up with that kind of stuff, <laughs> last thing at, the night, at, at, the, <laughs> at night. He always or first thing in the morning, uh, before we get up, same thing. At night, it seems to be easier. Look at the mind. Look what's he coming up with. All kind of things. We have very little control. We actually do have control. And there's a way of controlling what the mind comes with, up with. Because it's a saying, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, the mind can be your worst enemy or your best friend. So we have to train the mind. It's just like a dog. The dog needs to be trained. If the dog is not trained, it's just completely spoiled. He jumps on the table and starts eating from the plate and all kinds of things. Dog, cat, or just an example. But if the dog is very well trained, he sits down there, he doesn't sit on the table. And, <laughs> no, a good trained dog will not even do this. He will just peacefully sit there. And if we give him something to eat uh, from our plate or whatever, then we throw it at him and, or give it to him and he will eat it. So the mind has to become trained like this. And it can be trained. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, Srila Prabhupada's spiritual master, used to say, and uh, that is not for no reason. He speaks about the morning and the evening. He said, beat your mind a hundred times with a shoe. In the morning and in the evening, beat your mind a hundred times with a broomstick. <laughs> Very interesting example. Beat your mind with a shoe in the morning and beat your mind with a broomstick. Yes, that mind has to be beaten to submission. Otherwise, the mind will control us. Us, we, the spiritual soul, the spiritual person. We should not only say it's a spirit soul. That implies almost like there is no form and nothing. No, the soul has form. Like the glove. Now in winter, it's very cold. We're putting a five-fingered glove on. Why has a glove five finger? fingers? Why has a pants two legs? Because we have two legs. Huh? And the hand has five fingers. That's why. So why has this body 
that shape it has, because the spiritual body is inside. He has also this shape of two hands and two feet and so on. But that is a spiritual body is made out of spiritual energy. We cannot see that. So it's not just the soul of a kind of a spark of light or energy or something. No, it's much more than that. The soul has form and we're developing this form. We're developing our spiritual bodies, the Sita Deha, our spiritual form. So if we look now, we cannot perceive our spiritual form very much. We can perceive our material body. Yes, no problem. But we hear in Goloka or in Vaikuntha, there are innumerable Nitya Sitas, eternally liberated souls. They all have form. They're not spiritual sparks moving around. No, nothing of that sort. They have form. They have hands. In Vaikuntha, they have four hands. Bluish body. Crowns and garlands and just you couldn't tell the difference between Lord Narayan and the Vaikunda Basis. You couldn't tell the difference. In fact, when Gop Kumar traveled to Vaikunta after his long journey of spiritual elevation, he from being Lord Brahma, position of Lord Brahma he had for some time, and then he moved on and he went before Lord Brahma, he went to the various different planets of Mahaloka, Tapaloka, and so on, and associated with the sages and so also for Kumaras and all of that. And then eventually he came to Vaikuntha and when he saw the four armed uh, persons greeting him, and he fell down and said, oh my Lord, oh my Lord, finally I've met you. Immediately I stopped him. No, we are not the Lord. We are the servants of the Lord. We'll take you to the Lord, to Lord Narayan. So he mistook the Vaikunda Basis, the Vishnu Dutas, as we know from Archamil's story. He mistook them as the Lord himself because they looked just exactly like that. They're not the Lord, but they looked like the Lord. And that's one of the forms of liberation. Right, that one can obtain the same bodily features as the Lord. That can be accepted by devotees, but not the Yujya Mukti, merging into the existence of the Lord, merging into the Brahma Chyoti, and have the companies of Ravanas and Hiranya Kashipus, because they're only also merging into the Brahma Chyoti. We have to picture that. There is a spiritual world far beyond the material universe. There is a material universe with innumerable planets. Uh, and at the end of the material universe, in a uh, spheric form, in an egg-shaped form, there are layers, the coverings of the material universe. Each layer is a uh, hundred times more th thick than the previous layers. And the layers are earth, water, fire, air, mind, ether, mind, intelligence, and ego. These layers are once we moving towards the spiritual world, we have to cross all of these layers. And Gop Kumar explains these layers are very attractive, actually, very attractive. So attractive that someone could say, oh, let me stay here for a bit. No, we don't want to stay there. Move on, carry on, move further, move through the layers. And then there is a spiritual sky. Boom, there is light everywhere. Krishna explains there is, uh, there is no, in the spiritual world, there is no need for, in Bhagavad Gita, no need for sunlight and moonlight or electricity. All the spiritual planets are self-illuminating. Where is this illumination coming from? This illumination is coming from the Lord, from Lord Narayan in the various different innumerable spiritual planets floating in that illumination. And that illumination is coming from the Lord, from his bodily affulsions. In fact, from, the, from his toenails, that light is, is uh, reflected from his toenails. And within that Brahma Chyoti, they're floating the various different Vaikuntha planets headed by the different avatars, by the different Vishnu forms, uh, innumerable 
different Vishnu forms in Vaikuntha planets. So if we merge into the Brahma Chyoti, we are not entering the Vaikuntha planets. We are outside of the Vaikuntha, outside Vaikuntha. We are in the effulgence of Vaikuntha, which is uh, <laughs> kind of an elevated position. Huh? It's not the material world. It's eternal. The effulgence of the Lord is eternal. We can be there. But the demons also get this same mukti. They're also uh, being merging into that spiritual atmosphere. And that spiritual atmosphere has only uh, the eternity aspect. There is no bliss. Because we know Satchit Ananda, eternity full of knowledge, full of bliss. There is no bliss. But outside, we cannot go into Vaikuntha. Some are seemingly happy with merging, in, with floating into that uh, uh, Brahma Jyoti. And uh, it seems to be a better position than in this material world, and it is. But they cannot stay. Why? Because they haven't taken shelter of the Lord. It's just like a a spaceship, Sputnik, goes up. Elon Musk, his space shuttles going up. They're always coming down again. Why is they coming down? Why all the, everything was shooting up. They're always coming back to us. Why? They don't stay up there because they haven't found any shelter. That's the point. So if you go into the Brahma Chodi, there is no shelter. So we're neglecting the shelter of the Supreme Personality of God. So we have to come down again in this material world. So what have been gained? Nothing. We'll be back. Square one. So if we go further, we don't accept this liberation of merging into the Brahma Chodi. We actually enter the Vaikuntha planets, and they're gatekeepers. We know from the story of Chai and Vichai, they're gatekeepers. They don't let anybody in. If a demon wants to enter Vaikuntha, they say, no, forget it. You're only causing trouble. <laughs> demons always cause trouble to the Lord and the devotees. So they have no right to enter Vaikuntha. So troublemakers. Or if anybody else, the impersonalists who have chosen to merge into the Brahma Jyoti, they want to go into the Vaikuntha planets? No, sorry, sir. Go back to the material world, meet some pure devotees, get trained, then you come back. Like that. So then these Vaikuntha planets, they're floating into that spiritual effulgence of Brahma Jyoti. Everywhere, millions, innumerable Vaikuntha planets. And on top, on top of this, all of these Vaikuntha planets, there is one planet which is supreme to all, which is Goloka, Krishna Loka. There is no Vishnu with four hands. No. There is Krishna with two hands and a peacock feather. There's a gopi, there's Nanda Maharaj, Nanda Baba. Master Yashoda, there's a coward boy, there's a gopis. This is happening in Krishna Loka. This is the highest destination. And then we can have various relationships with the Lord. Every, everything has is spiritual, is made out of spiritual energy and is not formless. Well, like the soul appears to be just some energy or some light dot or some spark. No, it's not formless. And as we progress in our spiritual journey, we're developing our spiritual body. Not developing, it's already there within us, but we are uncovering our spiritual body. Like we're taking uh, the glove of the hand. But the glove, we ask one finger first, and then we pull, and the second finger comes off, and then all five fingers come off. And then we see, for the first time, we see the hand. We have only seen the glove, the material body so far. And then we see the hand. So we're developing, we're uncovering our spiritual body. 
then there will be no more return. Once we have entered through the gates of Vaikuntha, or we have gone to Goloka, there will be no more return. If we stay in the spiritual affliction, a good chance is there will be a return. We fall down again. Hare Krishna. So that was just a little bit a detour. Like, I have a soul. No, I am the soul. And we should watch ourselves. We sometimes, out of habit, we speak, yes, I have a soul. No, we are the soul. We should be very, very conscious. We should never think or speak, I have a soul. I am the soul. I have a body. I have this body. I have that body. But I am that spiritual person. And that spiritual form within them. Okay. Let's go one more further to text 23. And I would like to ask Rashika. Read us 23. You can read Sanskrit or not, up to you. Also, very important verse, 23. Very, very important. Na eman chindanti san sastrani nenam dahati pavaka na kainam kaiman kainam klidayanti spa apa Na so sayanti murutaha. Marutaha. Good, beautiful translation. The soul, the soul can never be cut into pieces by any weapon, nor can be burned by fire, nor moistened by water or withered by the wind. <clears throat> say, say something. It just uh, goes from one body to after that death it just can be transferred but it it just the soul we cannot destruct this destruct the soul yes interesting here nor can he be burned by fire Sri Prabhupada translate he he doesn't say nor can it be burned by fire it's a soul it which hints again at another thing. It, I have it, a soul. No, can he, a person? The soul is a person. We are a person. We are the soul. We are the person. No, can he be burned by fire? Now, there are different examples. The soul is indestructible. It's, it's of, of a completely different kind of energy. We cannot even imagine. So, we are, we are indestructible. We cannot be cut into pieces by any weapon. We cannot be burned, moistened by water or withered by the wind. We can't. We are eternal, we are indestructible. The body can, but we not. So again, this is another example of we are eternal, spirit, soul indestructible. We have been in this material world since millions and billions of lifetimes. And now we get a chance for the first time. How we know for the first time? Otherwise we wouldn't be here. For the first time in millions of birth, we have been getting a chance to be in contact with that knowledge and being in contact with a pure devotee who is distributing that knowledge as Bhagavad Gita as it is, and we get a chance of a way out. A way out. If we don't take the chance, we'll be in. Samsara Dava Nadalita Loka. We're staying in the Samsara. Millions and millions of more births. We don't want that. If we get a chance, like we would get a chance, someone says, here I have a winning lo lottery ticket. That's your chance. I give it to you. You want it? It's guaranteed a winning ticket. Euro million, sir. 
26 million is on that ticket. Will you take it? I'll give it to you. If we don't take that opportunity, we'll miss it. It's gone. It's gone. We miss the train. So if we don't take to that opportunity, which we are offered, therefore, it is so important. So important. And that can only be had and developed our spiritual life through the association of devotees. The Satu Sangha is so important. Most people don't understand that. Even devotees don't understand that. Oh, I know Bhagavad Gita. Huh? You get an answer like that? Oh, I, well, I, know, I have read it. I know Bhagavad Gita. Really? It's not about knowing Bhagavad Gita. It's about the association of devotees discussing Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam or hearing today when I sent out the text to everyone, I came across this quote, this beautiful quote, or what we sent out to everybody. Uh, and you know, uh, tru, tru, tru. Krishna subject matter is so nice that simply you do not do anything. Simply hear. That's all. You have got God given ear. You can hear. Sit down. So that is uh, God given uh, ability to hear. So all what we have to do, we can just hear. Here's his message. And by that hearing process, we have the chance now to get out. We can get out. There's great hope. It's not that, oh, I never can make it. No, it's not, not something like that. But we have to take advantage of the opportunity. Time is, is the most valuable thing. Srila Prabhupada constantly is saying in all of his writings and books and Bhagavatam is constantly saying, don't waste time. If you really look what we're doing in 24 hours, how much time we waste, how much other things we think it's more important than our actual salvation. So our actual salvation means getting out of the sams samsara, repeated birth and death. And time is running down. As I said before, 50 years, we easily 50 years here. I'm not the only one. I don't think so. Then old age starts. Srila Prabhupada said old age starts with 50 years. <clears throat> so I said that recently and someone said, oh, no, 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 no. Well, yes, you don't like to hear that. Yes, no. With 50 years old age starts. And then we're counting backwards, halfway through, 100 years the most. So we're counting back, 49, 48, 47, 46, closer to death. Happy birthday. Yes, one year closer to death. Very happy birthday. <laughs> Hare Krishna. You can say happy birthday up till 50 maybe, but then we say happy disappearance day. <laughs> Hare Krishna. So um, I'm just saying that to impress said time is very valuable. One minute lost can never be brought back. And it doesn't just happen like that we become. It can happen, but generally not. Srila Prabhupada talked to his uh, early disciples. So they asked him, how long does it take to become Krishna conscious? Of course, Krishna, uh, Srila Prabhupada also said, one minute. But then we have to agree to surrender. But uh, he gave another answer. He said, you are all young men. You are expected to live at least another 50 years. And then he said a very important statement. 50 years is more than enough to become fully Krishna conscious. That tells us a lot. Just this one statement. 50 years is more than enough to become fully Krishna conscious. It uh, tells us it takes some time 
It takes generally some time, but it doesn't take eternity. We are not hopeless. So if it takes 50 years, we have done very well. If it takes 50 years to become Krishna conscious, more than enough, so it will be less than that. Let's say it takes 40 years. It will take some time. What is 40 years to, be, to get free from the repeated birth and death? It's nothing. In this lifetime, we can go back to the spiritual world. If we want to, if we don't take it serious, then, well, we carry on. Next lifetime, will we get again the association of devotees? Who knows? Maybe not. So will we blow our chance for another 10,000 lifetimes? Hopefully not. So we should try our very best to make it in this lifetime. And if somehow or other, we have pursued with our fullest energy and we not just fully make it. So we can be sure one more birth, which is also not a bad deal. One more birth and then going back home to Godhead. Taking into account that we have been here for so many million births. So one more birth is not, but we can go back in this very birth. It can be accomplished. Okay. Okay, we'll take one more. 27. We'll back to Anil. No, Azu. Arzu, sorry. Manisha. Are you still here, Manisha? Yes. Read us that. There's a wrong character has come in. I have to ask Anil, what is the Sanskrit? You want to read the Sanskrit, Arasu? Um, I, I don't think I'll be able to read the Sanskrit, sorry. So read the translation. <laughs> that is fine. Yeah. That's my... <coughs> my... Sorry. My... For one who has taken birth, death is certain. And for one who is dead, birth is certain. Therefore, in the unavoidable discharge of your duty, you should not lament. Okay, what is, what is uh, Krishna telling Arjuna with this verse in the context of the battlefield? Don't, um, not to feel bad or lament if someone um, if someone is killed yeah. because it's part of more than that what what advice is it yes that is the first part what about the second part of that verse um it's unavoidable so it's it's sort of, it's bound to happen, so. He basically says, do your duty. Yeah. Isn't it? Do your duty. That is similar to the verses we had before. He's trying to convince Ashuna, do your duty. In the unavoidable discharge of your duty, you should, don't lament, just do your duty. Death is certain, birth is certain. The soul cannot be destroyed, be destroyed in the previous verse. Huh? So duty is very important. To do our duty according to Varna and Ashram, right? Very important concept. Huh? There are certain duties with, uh, with uh, ashramas, with a brahmachari, grihasta, vana, brashta, sannyasi. There are certain duties as a shutra, as a... Uh, uh, Vaishya, as a Kshatriya and as a Brahmana, we, uh, all duties. Uh, don't be not doing your duty just because you're going to die, you're going to take birth. Uh, uh, so many things. The, the duty has to go on. Right? Duty is actually a very wonderful concept. Even household duties, uh, right? 
we have all household duties. So. Anil, what is your household duties? What's your duty to the family? Uh, I think the foremost duty that uh, is to make sure uh, the people, those who are depending on you, are Krishna conscious. You must give them an opportunity. And uh, other than that, of course, to uh, look after the material needs. Uh, but yes, for beautiful. It is to make them Krishna conscious. Beautifully said. And you're quoting that uh, nobody should become a father, a mother, a teacher, a guru if you cannot, uh, if you cannot assure that his dependence will not take birth again, right? So you're doing your spiritual duty because you have brought Arzu along tonight and uh, not just a one-off, bring her every time, every time here. It's so beautiful, so nice. You're doing your spiritual duty. You make sure Manisha will not take another birth again. But that needs to be learned through the association of devotees huh? and then engagement in devotional service. And then there are many ways of engaging in devotional service. And we can all speak about that. There is a chanting of Hare Krishna. There's other services. Huh? And then through devotional service, engagement in Krishna's service, then the next thing is that the heart gets cleaned from all misgivings, anartani vritti. And then it comes to a stage of nishta, steadiness in Krishna consciousness, and asakti, attachment. And the higher stage is up to bhava, of spiritual emotions, up to prema, love of Godhead, finally, harivol. <laughs> so it starts with a little bit of shraddha and association of devotees. So duties, we finish in a moment. Duties, even material duties, you mentioned duties to the family. These are duties that have to be done. You have to go to work. It's not, I don't feel like. Today, I don't feel like going to work. I stay at home. Or uh, today, I don't feel like I don't wash the dishes. Let them pile up until there's nothing anymore, clean dishes available. <laughs> the duties have to be done. And if we do our duties, there is no, it's not, uh, how shall I say, it is not a fruitive activity, really. Duty isn't the mode of goodness, generally. It's not like we have some material desire and we want to fulfill it. I need a new car. I need a bigger car. I need a bigger house. I need a uh, latest phone model, uh, whatever. So it's not like that, which we have a desire. We want to get it and then we get it. It's not that uh, I need to, uh, we have a, a desire to wash the dishes. It's a duty. It's not like, oh, today I'm fulfilling my, my dream, my dream. Uh, I dreamt for it so many years uh, to wash the dishes. <laughs> it's not like that. It's just something which needs to be done. Therefore, it's in the mode of goodness, because we don't really expect a reward for it. Duty, mode of goodness, mode of passion, all these activities, we only do it because we get a reward for it. We only, uh, people only go to work because they get paid, right? Oh, your employer doesn't pay? Okay, I don't go to work. He doesn't even pay me. So generally, of course, some charitable persons, they will do some voluntary work without payment, but their payment is then to be recognized as a, good person. That is also a payment, generally. And if someone does some voluntary work and is not recognized and doesn't want anything in return, that's almost like devotional service, if it's connected with Krishna. Because pure devotional service, <clears throat> we don't want a reward. Of course, there are other mixed services, 
karma mishra bhakti, jnana mishra bhakti. These are mixed. Krishna accepts that as well, but he's not as pleased as if someone offers pure devotional service. Shuddha bhakti, not karma mishra, jnana mishra bhakti. So what is karma mishra bhakti? We, we want to satisfy Krishna, but we want something in return. Um, as I mentioned many times, long that example just sticks in my mind. Uh, long ago, I was at Radha Yatra in Leicester, giving out Maha, Mahaprasad, sitting there on the stage next to Chakanath. <coughs> People coming, bowing down to Chakanath, putting some money in the tin and getting some prasad or mahaprasad, and then people are asking for blessings. Nothing wrong about blessings. It's all about Krishna. They don't ask blessings from who? From Billy Gates or <laughs> who knows, whoever, politicians or this or that. They ask blessings from Jagannath or devotees of Chakanat. So what that, where they're asking? They're accepting the Mahaprasad, Hare Krishna put it to the head. Nice. And then they said, please bless me. Nobody said, please bless me, I become a pure devotee of the Lord. Not like hmm. Srila Prabhupada's father, Gomuhan De. He invited so many sannyasis to his house. He was a very charitable householder, and Srila Prabhupada witnessed all that. So many sannyasis, and everyone he asked, please bless my son, that he becomes a servant of Srimati Radharani. That was his request. He wanted blessings from Srimati Radharani for Srila Prabhupada. So nobody at Radha Yatra asked, Please bless me, I becoming a servant of Srila Prabhupada. Please bless me, I becoming a wonderful devotee. No. People are asking, please bless me, I pass my driving test. <laughs> please bless me, I, my new house will be, and so, so many things. All material blessings. Krishna will accept that and is happy if we run to him for blessings or run to him when the fire is in the house. So Krishna, fire department. <clears throat> He's pleased about that, but there is no question how pleased he is if we offer him service without wanting anything in return. Right? We don't want anything back. We want to just serve Krishna without any material things back, which is business relationship. And we don't want Gyan back. I want to, I want knowledge, which is better, better than material blessings. Because Krishna is knowledge. So these are all mixed Mishra, pure devotion. That is wanted. Serving Krishna without being recognized as a big devotee, without any of that. Just we are happy with serving Krishna. Hare Krishna. And at this point, we want to stop before Rashika leaves and Anil leaves. Uh, and uh, I'm just keep on talking here. Any questions, Anil or Rashika? Any questions? Anil. Uh, no, Prabhu, no questions. This has been a very uh, nice session. <laughs> Many questions were answered uh, within the verses. Many questions you have? Like what? No, no, I said many questions were answered uh, within the verses. <laughs> yes, absolutely. These verses are answering many questions. What about you, Rashika? Um, no questions. It's 
it's nice to read Bhagavad Gita together. And we that's just, a point. Yes. That's a point. Oh, wow. That was a beautiful comment. It's nice to read Bhagavad Gita together. And that's the whole purpose of this workshop. And of course, we're also learning about Bhagavad Gita yes. more and more and more. We're learning about Bhagavad Gita, but actually the point is the association, the Satu Sangha. It's nice to read Bhagavad Gita together. You couldn't have said anything nicer as a final word here in tonight's Satu Sangha. Okay, here we stop. We'll see you all back on Saturday with Srimad Bhagavatam. It's a beautiful, beautiful chapter, Rashika. Please do come here. Huh? It's uh, uh, the birth of Emperor Parikshit. We had some beautiful verses, and there are many more important, important verses. And again, it's the Sadhu Sangha with a different set of devotees. Anil, will you come on Saturday as well, as promised? Uh, yes, Prabhu. Definitely will. Come. Hare Krishna. <laughs> okay. With my daughter. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes. It is wonderful you brought her here tonight. Huh? And uh, do that again. We'll see you all back on Saturday, 7 o'clock. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.